Welcome everyone to the panel AI for the Sustainable Development Goals. This panel is part of the AI for People track of the 2021 for AI for Climate Global Forum. My name is Lucia Troches. I am the Global Forum Director, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I would like to welcome our special guests for this session, Dr. Chantal Line Carpentier, Dr. Clovis Freire, and Dr. Maria Perez Ortiz who will share with us some interesting information about the intersection between new technologies and AI systems and sustainable development. I would like to tell you more about our expert guests. Dr. Chantal Line Carpentier currently serves as chief of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development at the New York Office of the Secretary General, where she coordinates input into the financing for sustainable development, science, technology, and innovation, and monitors progress on sustainable development goals processes. She focuses on partnerships and innovative financing to support micro, small, and medium enterprise, entrepreneurship, and gender equality in transitioning to green, blue, purple, orange, Brazilian, inclusive, and connected economic systems. Dr. Camp Carpentier of her PhD in Agricultural and Environmental Economics from Virginia Tech University, as well as both her MSc and BSc in Agriculture Economics from McGill University. Now moving forward with Dr. Clovis Freire. He is an economist working at the Division on Technology and Logistics Development on the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. He is trained as a computer engineer with a PhD in economics from the University of Maastricht, specialized in economics of technological change and innovation. He coordinated and was the lead author of the Technology and Innovation Report 2021, focusing on how developing countries can catch the new wave of technological change to drive structural transformation and sustainable development while minimizing the risks of increasing inequalities. Before joining UNCTAD, is his 18 years with the United Nations. He worked at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs in New York and the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific. And last but not least, our interview for today's session. Dr. Maria Perez Ortiz is a computer scientist with a passion for the pursuit of a sustainable future working as a senior research fellow at the AI Center at University College London. Prior to that, she was a research associate at the University of Cambridge in London, a lecturer at University of Loyola, Andalusia, Spain, and a research assistant at the Spanish National Research Council at the University of Córdoba. Part of her research focuses on the application framework of artificial intelligence for sustainable development mostly for biomedicine, environmental sustainability, and education. One of her latest works with title Seasonal Arctic Sea Ice Forecasting with Probabilistic Deep Learning was published in Nature Communications with the British Antarctic Survey leading the work. Builds a conservation tool to predict sea ice loss in the Arctic with machine learning. Dr. Chantal, Dr. Clovis, and Dr. Maria it's an honor to be here with you today. Now, I would like to pass the microphone to Dr. Clovis, who will present some information about the Technology and Innovation Report 2021. Dr. Clovis, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you again for the opportunity to highlight some of the findings of the Anctad's Technology Innovation Report 2021. At the end of the next 10 minutes, you have a better idea of the relationship between frontier technologies and inequalities and what governments, business, civil society, and the international community can do to guide the development and diffusion of this technology towards inclusive and sustainable development. The, the report of, uh, of ANCTAD makes the point that the great divides between countries that we see today, they started after the Industrial Revolution. Since then, every wave of progress was associated with sharper inequality. Now the gap in the average income per capita between developed and developing countries is over $40,000. But a few countries, notably from in Asia, they were able to catch up through technological learning, imitation, and innovation. Many factors affect the dynamics of economic inequality, including wars, epidemics like COVID-19, 
and the effects of trade and globalization. But one of the factors is the impact of technological revolutions. The report notes that the world is at the peak of the age of ICT and it's starting a new paradigm of Industry 4.0. The deployment of ICT resulted in an enormous concentration of wealth in the ownership of major digital platforms. There is also persistent digital divides as highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So how frontier technologies will affect inequalities between countries will depend on national policy and also on the involvement of countries on international trade and, and production and trade structure. The, Technology Innovation Report 2021, it covers 11 technologies. Artificial intelligence, the topic of today is one of them. We also cover Internet of Things, Big Data, Blockchain, 5G, uh, 3D printing, robotics, drones, gene editing, nanotechnology, and solar photovoltaic. Estimates suggest that these technologies already represent a $350 billion market and one that by 2025 could grow to over $3.2 trillion. Many of the major providers of these technologies are from the United States and China, which are responsible for 30 to 60% of patents and publications. A new readiness index presented in the report gives us a picture of the national capabilities to equi equitably use, adopt, and adapt frontier technologies. In general, the economies most ready for the equitable deployment of these technologies are in North America and Europe. Most of least ready countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. But there are clearly many outliers. Um, countries that perform better than their per capita GDP would suggest. The greatest outperformer is India, ranking 65 positions higher than expected, followed by Philippines, which ranks 57 positions higher. Countries that outperform have invested in R&D and industrial activity and access to finance. But countries, developing countries, they need to do more to provide access to internet and digital skills. From the production perspective, each wave of technological change brings inequality in new shapes. Today, a major concern is that AI and robotics will reduce employment. But most alarmist scenarios do not consider that not all tasks in, in a job are automated. And most importantly, that new products, tasks, professions, and economic activities are created throughout the economy as well. The impact of AI on inequality between countries will depend to some extent on the type of input data. If AI primarily use big data generated by users, this will mainly benefit the United States and China. Their competing digital platforms get massive amounts of data. If AI primarily use big data generated by Internet of Things, this may benefit other countries with strong manufacturing, such as countries in the EU, Japan, and Republic of Korea. If, com if computers learn by generalizing from models and a few examples, this would still demand resource and capabilities more likely to be found in developed countries, leaving developing countries behind. So preparing for this frontier revolution, frontier technology revolution requires promoting their use, adoption and adaptation of these technologies. But developing countries face many challenges and the report highlights uh, five of them. The first is the change in demographics. By 2050, most of the increase in population will be in sub-Saharan Africa and firms there may have fewer incentives to use automation as a form of saving labor costs. Another challenge is the technological gap. The risk is that low-income countries will also fall behind in the adoption of Industry 4.0, widening the technological gap. Yet another challenge is this, this low diversification of many commodity-dependent countries. So, you know, the capacity to use common technologies in manufacturing, it helps firms to adopt new tech clouds. In developing countries, particularly least developed countries, they have less public and private resource to fund research and innovation. Also, stringent intellectual property rights are likely to reinforce existing technological divides. Developing countries need to adopt frontier technologies, but while continue to diversify their production, mastering existing te technologies. This is critical, so it's two things to do. 
the adopt protect technology by continue to diversify their production base. So they need to align innovation and industrial policies, keeping national industry competitive. This will require better access to patent technologies and opportunities for technological learning. Some of the finance for innovation can come from impact investment, venture capital, crowdfunding, and innovation technological funds. Policymakers also need to anticipate the impact on the workforce, and workers should be able to rely on st strongly on mechanism of social protection. Also, labor unions will have a bigger role to play to protect workers' rights, especially in the gig work uh, on platforms and in automation. Now let's turn to the other side of the analysis, the potential impact of technology on inequality through the perspective of the users of the technology. So one of the most critical aspects is access and which can be considered to comprise of combination of five A's, availability, affordability, awareness, accessibility, and the ability for effective use. The, again, developing countries face particular challenges um, in terms of access. A major issue is the higher level of poverty in developing countries. In upper middle income countries and high income countries, the average share of population living in extreme poverty is only 2%, but in low income countries is about 45%. So as a result, access to goods and services is more difficult to a larger share of population in developing countries. A second challenge is the digital divide. Of almost half of the world's population remains offline and most in developing countries. Then we also have that the shortage of skills in developing countries when compared with developed countries. One major concern, also another major concern are related to bias design and unintended consequence of AI and inequalities and ethical considerations of gene editing. Bias within AI systems can arise because they employ bias algorithms or bias data for training and this came from the reality, so the bias reality of different societies. For example, one study found that being signed into a Google account as women reduced likelihood of seeing advertisements for higher paying jobs. Regarding gene editing, a 2017 study shows the, the disparities in the use. So most clinical trials of gene therapy were in the United States and Europe, majority of them. And gene editing also raises ethical questions such as what constitutes an hum, ideal human being. So developing countries should be able to rely on international cooperation to promote and guide the development and deployment of new technologies so that they support inclusive and sustainable development. This is particularly the case for, to build, uh, needed to build a stronger national capacities in science, technology, innovation, to smooth technology transfer, to increase women's participation in tech sectors and, and innovation, to improve foresight and technological assessments to better understand the social, economic, and environmental implications of frontier technologies, and to promote inclusive debate on how new technologies affect people and societies and how they can promote the, the SDGs. So let me conclude with the following three points. First, Developing countries, particularly low-income countries, they cannot afford to miss this new wave of technological change. Second, each country will need science, technology, innovation policies appropriated to their stage of development to prepare people and firms for a period of rapid change. And third, this will require a balanced approach, building a robust industrial base and promoting frontier technologies that can help deliver the 2030 agenda. So this is a nutshell of the report. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this, uh, find this with you. Thank you so much. To be honest, like I'm so impressed with the information and a little bit alarmed with some of the statistics and of course the actions that we need to take care of um, in order to move towards that development of artificial intelligence in a sustainable and responsible way. Uh, I would like to pass the microphone to Dr. Maria Perez, who's going to start with the conversation. So Dr. Perez, please go ahead. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this panel on such a timely topic. I am delighted to be here and be having this conversation. And I think we need to urgently be discussing these issues. And it's very interesting for me that five years ago, this same panel will have hyped these technologies a lot. We will have had a very 
techno heroic somehow narrative surrounding technology. And I think it's it's very important that we nowadays are aware that technology, as as Clovis was um, um, explaining, can have both a positive and a negative impact. We need to be aware of both sides and we need to work together to ensure the future that we want. So I have read the report in detail and prepared a set of conversation triggers accordingly that I'll start with. But first of all, I'm aware that these are huge questions. So maybe we won't have a definite answer to these questions yet, but I think it's important to bring them to the, to the uh, foreground of the conversation so that this, we are aware that these are things that we need to be thinking and discussing. So I'm particularly curious, first of all, uh, my first question would be about the implementation of some of the key policy areas of the report, specifically there's a part of the report that says policy, policy makers should direct technological change towards societal needs. So my question is, in your view, how can we achieve this? How can we, in essence, make sure that we effectively govern technologies that change at such a fast pace? Right. If I, if I may start, Chantalin. Um, thank you very much. I think it's a very insightful question, Maria. Uh, I think that uh, when we think about technological change, we always think about uh, build, uh, inventing something and changing technology. And so when we say policymakers should direct technological change, it's how it comes from my, how policymakers can direct that, that process. But actually to answer that question, we need to go one step back and, and properly define technological change. Actually, technological change at the societal level happens through the diffusion of new technologies in production processes, in infrastructure, and new goods and services that, are, that people use. So this is basically innovation, is the introduction of new products or the improvement of existing products and processes using new technology. So each process requires a set of technology to be produced. So uh, each new product, but also each new product becomes a new technology that can be used in further combinations for creating still other new goods and services. For example, when a smartphone was introduced in the economy and it became a building block for other innovations. And Developing technology requires knowledge, information, facts, general principle about the phenomena that is being exploited. And science constructs and organizes this knowledge in the form that is testable, is, tests explanations and predictions about this phenomena. So science is necessary to understand more than phenomena and science technology for evolve. So in a way, when, when we say direct technology change or guide technological change we are think we are, in a way we are talking about doing that through science technology and innovation and governments can influence the pace and direction of technological change by influencing the direction and pace of scientific research of deployment of technology and of introduction of new products and services in the economy and production process in the economy. So in that sense, uh, affecting the innovation process. So policymakers do that through policies and policy instruments. They do, they affect those kinds of things all the time. So for example, uh, this policy and policy instruments should be guided ideally by national development policies and also by the SDGs. So in concrete terms, in the area of science, Policy instruments could include grants for research or budget for our universities or research institutes. And the, gov and the government can give the direction for that. For example, promoting research projects that deal with resilience or climate change and that use new technologies. So in a way, you, there is a way that policy make it to do that. In the area of technology diffusion, the government can promote a competition in, in promote competition in data sectors to reduce the price of data services, for example. So promoting the diffusion of, uh, of digital technologies and uh, in a way that is more inclusive, reducing the price. In the area of innovation, there are several policy instruments that governments can use both to direct the supply of goods and services in the economy and also to influence demand. For example, R&D funding. Uh, uh, 
innovation funding for companies, equity support to venture and seed capital, um, removal of subsidies for unsustainable activities. In the demand side, we could use sustainable procurement, uh, public procurement, or we can support private demand in certain areas. So note that this is not; those are not new tools. These are policy instruments that government use all the time. What is important is that you have the national development priorities and the SDGs as the guide for use of these policy instruments. And so, in Clovis, do you mind if I jump in? Because Please. I think, it, it, yeah. So basically, you, as you all know, our our most countries have already prepared, and it's voluntary, but they prepare voluntary national reviews for how they implement the SDGs, right? And and once they pretty much prioritize and then cluster the SDGs they're going to focus on. The next question, of course, is how are we going to get there? And then there's institutions and there's policies. And in the policy, as Clovis was saying, what are the STI policy that you need? Uh, what are the industrial policy that you need <laughs> to achieve that? And then, as Clovis said, um, and what where we've seen a specific example is in Canada, uh, for instance, is the research, like the equivalent in the U.S. of National Institute of Health, has basically said, okay, we will ask every uh, uh, anybody that asks for funding in Canada from now on to tell us how they contribute to the SDGs, which SDG and how they're going to do it. So that's another way to do it, um, as well as the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Through the partnership with the universities, your startup ecosystems, your, your accelerators, and your, you can also affect um, the, 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 the direction of, of the innovation in your country and the deployment of technologies in your countries. And of course, just one last thing, because it's very important, business schools curriculum. So what we're finding when we work with business school, when they start teaching in the entrepreneurship classes, the, the, the what are the SDGs and the business opportunities associated with the SDGs, right away, you they find that they get a lot of the ideas targeted towards the SDGs because they want to have a purpose. They want to, to have a, a serve society and it actually has a big impact. Such fantastic comments, thank you. This links perfectly actually to my next question because now we've been talking about policy and I wanted to ask more on an individual level, what we people developing the AI, building these kind of technologies, can we do in order to ensure these technologies have a positive impact? And this is because I, I assume that many of the participants of the forum are going to be somehow involved in AI, developing these models, researching them. And I think for us, it's very important to engage uh, and to ask, you know, what are the questions that need solving in the world so that we can then go and do our math and do our engineering and build the models that can help um, these questions, right? And I'm very interested personally in your opinion in this topic because at UCL we are building at the moment a new master program on AI for sustainable development. Still lucky in the final sign off, but it will um, start next September. So my question for you is what can we researchers, engineers, educators working on AI, can we do to ensure that we achieve the SDGs? Is there any way that we can predict or analyze if a specific technology is going to increase inequalities or have a negative impact on, on the SDGs? So again, if I can start with that one, you know, the you have you gave an example, right? So you can use uh, you can uh, in your own work, you have used AI to, to see how that can contribute to better understanding changing climate and how that uh, that's affected the environment. And then you can start to, to perhaps from that to devise some action to, to how to mitigate or adapt to it. So, of course, um, we can always use the SDGs as the goal in terms of what you are trying to model, what you are trying to understand in terms of the world. And that will, for, for, for sure, will give us more information about uh, yeah, this process and will help us to, to move in the right direction. That is one way to use that. But then when you, you ask, how can we ensure that uh, 
that uh, a technology that you are devolving is will not uh, increase inequality. So that is a little bit more complex, right? So let me use an example to illustrate. And a very simple example outside of AI is so to have for us to have in mind. So suppose we want to build a bridge. So science will help us to understand the properties of the material to be used to build the bridge, right? Engineering will be used to know how to combine the different technologies to create that bridge. But the act of actually building a particular bridge in a particular place and time and deciding who can use that bridge and how much they should pay to cross the bridge. And if there will be winners and losers because that bridge was built, who are the unions, who are the users, you know, the losers. So that's, that is the innovation part of the bridge process. You really put in the bridge in the market, you know. So bringing, when you bring a new product, good or service to the market, that is the time where this social context become really emerge. And then you can have inequality or not, and you can have other, you can increase inequality, but reduce uh, the environmental impact. Or you can reduce inequality and increase the environmental impact. Or you can increase, you know, reduce inequality and reduce environmental impact. So depend on where you will really apply. So for researchers that are developing models, developing technology, they are a little bit far from that phase, phase of the implementation as an actual product yourself. But when you are engaged on that part, on the innovation process, really bring a process, a, 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 pro, a product or good to market at that point, then you can consider who are the users of this technology? Now, how they will use this technology? Why is this inclusive? What is the impact on, on, on other areas of the development? At that point, you can do that. Of course, inequality, it's really social. So it's at more at the end. But when you deal with other aspects of sustainability, like uh, environmental sustainability, then you can deal with that in science and technology development. Because you can, you can think about uh, how you develop uh, the technology that is less, um, 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 that use less material or that is more sustainable, right? Or how you can, you, that, that model can be used that, that is the more sustainable methods. So that, that you can do at the science and technology level as well. So that is how I see these, these ways to, 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 to work towards um, sustainable goals. And if I may just complete and completely agree with what Clovis has just said, but I, I guess one way to ensure from the get go that you will not have more inequality or that your innovation will be inclusive, right, Clovis, is to have a diversified team working with you because you will see the world according to your vision. But if you have somebody of different ethnic groups, of women and of gender and of region of the world, you are probably gonna see the problem in a different way. So having diversity in your team is gonna help. Multidisciplinarity, right? To, to look at it from different sciences, as Clovis was mentioning, um, there will be trade off synergies amongst the SDGs and you need to be able to model those. And actually we should rely more on the university to do foresight work and modeling of the synergies and, and trade off amongst SDGs so that not only our government, but also the, the, the private sector can see them and the entrepreneurs. So not everybody has to re, re, reinvent the wheel. Um, and, and, and the one thing that we're not taught to do at the university is to ask ourselves, who will be left behind with this technology or with this policy? And we need to just change that and ask ourselves. So Mary, I'm challenging you in your new program that always ask, ask your student, ask themselves that question. <laughs> yes, that is actually one of the points of the program. Yes, definitely. And I think this, this has already started in AI because now there are many conferences in the topic that ask you to fill out a paragraph on the broader impact of the technologies. But you see many simplistic answers, such as, well, this can be used in medicine, which means, you know, it's contributing to this sustainable development goal. And I have, I did have that narrative for a very long time and analyzing my own research, as Clovis was saying, 
I have asked myself this question. So for example, I work on sustainable agriculture using AI for a long time. And then at some point I ask myself the same question that you just asked. Um, is this going to increase inequality because small farmers are not going to have access to drones, to AI, to these technologies? And the same happened in, in, in many um, problems that I've worked on that were aligned with sustainable development goals. So for example, I work on a, on a, on a problem in medicine for seven years, just to realize after seven years that we built a very biased model against women. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to see the other side of the coin and be asking all the time, what is going to ha what is the negative side? Um, and I think hopefully this will converge to a, some sort of standard that we AI researchers can have so that we can evaluate these algorithms, not only in terms of how they perform, like accuracy, but also in terms of how they impact the sustainable development goals. And it's probably quite a bit, Maria, that can be taken from the user experience movement, right? It's all about user experience. Well, what does that mean in terms of user experience of the diversified voices and, and clients out there for these technologies, right? True, true, true. So some design justice. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, I think this links as well to my to my next question because when we talk about discussing a technology in terms of a of a sustainable development goal, we need to think as well how these goals are intertwined, how they are interconnected. Uh, so in terms of inequality, do you see any specific goals that could have the biggest impact in our ability to ensure that technology doesn't exacerbate? Inequality would perhaps be education one of the main goals in order to ensure a more equal future. Do you want to start with this one, Chatelaine? If you want. I mean, education is one, but capacity building and institutional capacity in developing countries is another one. Decision makers need to be in a, in a position to understand um, uh, these issues and these intricacies. But there's another one that is very interesting that is raising in, uh, um, in, in, in interest, and we're looking into it at the UN Network of Economists. And it's this idea of uh, AI being used right now as we speak already and in, in guiding a lot of our choices, oftentimes without us even realizing that it's guiding our choices. And the business model for the big platform is not for us to be happier or to contribute more to the SDGs, it's to make us buy more things that we probably don't need. So it's actually going against SDG uh, 12 on this sustainable consumption production and probably make us unhappier and probably uh, less cohesive society, which is SDG 16. And so the whole attention economy, I think AI designers need to pay attention to the attention economy and how we actually flip it on its head. And if you're gonna make me click more often and stay on the web longer, it's to do better. How do you do that? So I'm putting that challenge back at you, Mary. <laughs> so how do we create this world game where we all want to contribute and we compete not to kill someone, but to help everyone and achieve the SDGs? Over to you, Clovis. <laughs> yeah. well, that's a very good point. I think that uh, I totally agree with you, Chantaline. I, I think that uh, the productive capacity are key. You know, in this Technology Innovation Report uh, 2021, we note that most of global inequality today is due to the lottery of birthplace. This is totally different from at the, when in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 80% of inequality, what was inequality between classes and only 20% between countries. Today, 80% is between countries and 20% only between cars. In a way that if you were to born today and you don't, and you don't know where you're gonna board, in which strata of society you're gonna board, you'll be better off if you, if, you, if you select the country than if you select the decile of the society. And because you may end up being born in a, higher desire, but in a very low income country. So given that inequality higher is between countries to reduce global inequality, actions should be directed to reduce this inequality between countries. That to, the actions to do that will have a higher return, right? So the SDGs that are directly related to that are SDG 8, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and product employment, and decent work for all, 
in SDG 9 to promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. They're also the building resilience uh, infrastructure as part of that goal. So these two goals really contribute directly to reducing this inequality between countries. In education for sure is very important, but what we see is that in many low income countries, we, there is a lot of uh, countries with a lot of uh, also disparities there. They tend to export their best trained people. They, these, they, they migrate, they go to other countries, you know, or they try to go to other countries simply for better opportunities. So what these countries lack are not educated people, even though the education should improve and, and can improve and we should do that, but it's the lack of jobs, of productive capacities. So what a majority of these countries need is a diversified economy that creates new jobs for their youth population. Yeah? And SDGs eight and nine can do that. And that's the work of Ankita that is very much related to SDGs eight and nine. Okay, so now that we are talking about design justice, global inequality, and representing the voice of everyone, uh, my, next, my next question is how can we ensure that? How can we ensure that we have the interests of low and middle income countries in mind, and these are represented in key debates, in, in decision making, and how can we create you know, these bridges between nations and countries? Uh, where nations where country where uh, the AI would be used and countries where AI is being developed and I think this is this is a question that we need to be asking ourselves because there are many reports that are highlighting the failures of taking these technological advances to countries where maybe we haven't the people that we are developing these technologies we haven't thought about social cultural norms or uh, poor electrical supply, or we haven't built a relationship with the global government. We haven't asked for participation of the local community and we, we haven't thought maybe of a viable financial model. So how can we uh, include the interests of these countries in, in, in the conversation? Right. Want to start, Clovis? Yes, I, I want to start and before I say how can we do that, I, I want to, to only make it sure that what we are uh, ask, suggesting countries to do is not to only, you know, use the technology that was developed in developed countries and just use the technology. It's not a passive use of technology. What we, when you say use, adopt and adapt this technology is actually bring that technology, put in their production process and use it in production and eventually even develop these technologies as well. But it's really using the production process. So when we talk about, uh, you know, when we talk about this process of technological revolutions like AI and AI going to all kinds of uh, uh, economic activities and so on, these are processes that are very deep and broad. They affect society, the economy, the way that people deal with each other, the way that people deal with the environment. It's like you imagine the world before 90, 1970s, you know, nobody with a cell phone and now the world today is totally different. And not only because you have that technology, you, you change how society operates, right? So, this happens usually initially at the core countries of these technological revolutions. So AI is a little bit more global than previous technological revolutions. So that's a good thing. It's not only concentrated on one country, but uh, still there are few countries that push this development, right? And over time, you have changes in the economy, in society, institutions, in consum consum consumption patterns, and everything that is co-evolved and intertwined in these countries that are the core of this technological revolution. The problem is that this technology, they go to developing countries with big delays and out of phases, you know? So first it comes the infrastructure. So first people start to have access to smartphones and mobile internet. And then they have access to, to the change in consumption patterns. So now you see a big push for developing countries to, to, to increase uh, e-commerce so they can buy things from developed countries, right? So 
only later on you see these technologies going into production process, to production. What you really push is to have that go into production earlier to, for this de delay to, to, to this time lag to be reduced. So to do that, first developing countries need to understand this process. They need to understand that those technological changes have this broad uh, impact. And if they miss these technological uh, waves, they will be lagging further behind. They should understand that they should continue diversifying their economies, build their production capacity so they can make this process easier. So they need to understand that. And, and, and we try to do that through reports like this one, the Technology Innovation Report, through dissemination of these findings as we are doing now. So this is one thing. Developed countries, they do have a lot of capacity to understand that, but in developing countries, particularly low income, these developed countries, it, it, the capacity is not that, that high. And the second is to bring all countries to the table and to discuss this process. So we do that in ANCTAD. We do that at the United Nations Commission of Science Technology for Development. We do that through the um, multi-stakeholder Science Technology Innovation Forum uh, every year uh, in New York. So uh, ways that we try to bring all countries together, stakeholders for countries, not only government, so we can discuss the, this, these issues and they can understand and then we can, uh, in a way, raise awareness and, and change the, um, the direction of the, the policies of these countries towards these uh, frontier technologies and, and the SDGs. So this is a long uh, answer to that question. Um, um, Chantaline, <laughs> you would like to, to add something to that? Well, if we have time, just quickly to say that many of these, uh, as, as as Clovis said, institutions do affect the markets, right? And we don't live in a neutral institutional framework. We have the BTO, we have the IMF and the World Bank that guide a lot of the, the transaction on the planet. So for instance, as now developing countries, are, are, their voice is not really represented uh, strongly at the WTO reform on special and differentiated treatment, for example. So that's where we give a little bit more of space for developing country to develop and catch up with us. And now there's some of the reform at the WTO are trying to remove that space from developing countries. And, and, to, and then so that means they will have even less capacity and ability to access this technology. Our UNCTAD's latest trade and development report, um, right, released right before COVID, uh, COVID, before COP26 last week, basically says that all green mitigating uh, and, and adaptive technologies to climate change should actually be declared public good and therefore made affordable and accessible to all. And that means we would need to have a fund to get there. But you can imagine that that is a concept. And then we talk about trip waivers, the intellectual property rights protection at WTO for uh, the vaccine. And we see the, all the heated debate around that. UNCTAD is actually claiming that we should have a waiver on these technologies as well, on intellectual property, giving a, a, a license for developing country to be able to adapt and adopt better this technology. Because if we truly believe that we, are, we have a climate and uh, existential crisis go in front of us, we need to act as though we're in the wartime. And that's what we do in wartime. We put all of our resources to be able to go forward. Just wanted to add it, that, that global perspective in terms of... Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, uh, Clovis. Thank you so much. Uh, I think our time is up, but I think this was a tremendously fruitful conversation. I learned a lot from the report and I'm looking forward to go back to it and read even more. And I just wanted to close with a sentence that once an educator told me, and I think it stayed with me, and I keep repeating it uh, in, in these AI and society forums, because I think it's very, very important to keep in mind. And what he told me was, you AI researchers or AI engineers or mathematicians and computer scientists, you know how to solve problems. You just don't know what problems need solving in the world. <laughs> So we need, to, we need to have this type of conversation so that we solve the right problems. Brilliant, yes. <laughs> I love it so much, Marianne. You know what's uh, it's exciting is that there's a lot of women at this table. So please, we need more women in AI. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. 
Um, so thank you so much for the conversation. It was a really great honor to be here present for that interaction. Uh, I agree with most everything you said. I think uh, Dr. Clovis, your report and all the data that you presented today, it's really important, as you said, the technological change brings impact. And ideally, uh, the combination of developed and on develop and developing countries can be together to make sure that this is a more leveled effort, right? That's what we want um, as well from this conversation in the AI for, for Climate Global Forum. And Dr. Chantaline, thank you so much for, for your, in, for your um, interaction as well. I agree with you that institutions are a fundamental part of what we're doing right now. And I do believe that we need more women in AI as well. Uh, this is one of the goals that we are trying to achieve as well from the CMINES team. Um, Maria, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful uh, interviewing experience. And um, we will be in touch with all of you for the future and uh, making sure that we follow up with your programs and with all of the initiatives that you are developing uh, currently and in the future. So thank you so much for being here and for those at home that are watching this panel uh, stay tuned for other content at AI for Climate uh, at the Global Forum and our platform. Thank you. Thank you.